we should not control. We had our own forms of government and ways to help our own people. The federal government policies and programs we have been operating under are not working for us. Our leaders have been saying for years we want out of the Indian Act. We are now at a place where we can begin to make this happen. The government's agreements have been driven between Canada and the Indian Nation. What people need to know is that, you know, what are the kinds of lawmaking powers that are recognized under the agreement? So the first one is elections. So this will give us the authority to elect our leadership under our own election laws. Citizenship is really important. Having the power recognized to develop our own citizenship laws and of course generate our own citizenship lists. Culture is important because you know, the cultural ceremonies we use, the governor's office, the legal staff, our sunrise ceremony, our medicines, our belt. This last one is just having our own power to do things that other governments can do, like having financial management done. This government's agreement with Canada were formally recognized what we have always known that we have the right to govern ourselves. We would control what kind of actions are happening in the what kind of laws. If we can get back to that, everything in our culture will lead us to a good life. The one we've been able to negotiate and ultimately change in this agreement is a substantial increase in funding, actually a sevenfold increase in funding. What that money means is the capacity now for you to start dreaming about what it is you want to go to the world The Indian Acts and then part of the government's role in the lives of our people and still affects us to this day. But let us not forget that moving beyond the Indian Act is not the end in itself, but rather it means to an end. That end being more prosperous nations where all of us play active roles in our systems of governance with our people enjoying a better quality of life. There's a vote on the unit coming up in the next few months, so it's really important that people have a better idea of what it is they're actually voting on. People living in the communities, pay attention. Pay attention to what's happening. This is a good thing. Get out and vote. It's going to be a big change and it's going to be for the better. We are so capable. We're in this amazing story that's happening right now, and we have an opportunity to make changes. We have an opportunity to shape what that future will look like. So it's truly the Shabby people working for the 
shall be people. We work for you, and this is the, this is what we've, we've uh, been told to do, and what we're going forward. And I also just want to say that I can speak for myself, and probably the rest of my and the rest of the people that I work with. I wouldn't be here talking about this agreement, promoting this agreement, if I truly didn't believe in what this stands for, what it's going to do for our people, what it's going to do for my son, my mother, my father, my sisters, my nieces and nephews, and my grandchildren to come. I would never do anything to jeopardize my rights as a Mishnabe or the rights of my family and my friends, including you. So with that, I'll start the uh, presentation. So the government's Make sure that our language and our culture is kept 
we talked about citizenship law, but we want to make sure we're not talking about status. So please keep trying to keep status away from your thinking. Canada would not give up status. They control the, that definition of status. But you have to remember, status is a definition of the Indian Act, of mine Act. Status does not define you as an Ishabe. You, the Ishabe is an Ishabe. And as Ishabe people, we know who our citizens are. We know just because somebody doesn't have status and they are Nishabe, that's who we want. We know who they are. Now, there's also, uh, there's also not me. I'm married to a man named Man. He lives in Dokis. Um, he lives in Dokis. He's a citizen. He should have the rights, response rights, uh, rights, responsibilities, and privileges in the community just as I have. But I can tell you in Dokis, and I'm sure in most first nations, as a non native person, you won't have the right to vote in our elections. That will be part of, that will belong to the Shami people of Dokis. Now that's up to you to decide what. Now this is also very important because moving forward, we said this is that this doesn't um, this doesn't involve status. But moving forward in, in future negotiations, we want to take these lists. Just pretend that Nipsey has 500 status members. I know it's much bigger than that, but pretend you have 500 status Indians on your ban list. But if you have your own citizenship list, you might have 3,000. Moving forward in negotiations, we're going to take those actual numbers that the embassy says that they're citizens, and that's what we're going to negotiate with Canada because we provide programs and services to everyone. That's that's the way we that's the way we do things as Nishami people. We also take in people in uh, the East. I don't know if anybody remembers Denise. Um, he came into the community. We don't even know where he came from, but he was a community member. He, he ended up going out there, and we have people. Thank you. 
which is probably already being done. Also, just to, to one of the things that we want to get away from was the uh, First Nation, I forget what it was, but it was a requirement of all First Nations in Canada under the health government that they had to report their honorarium to travel expenses and salaries and so forth the chief council and have that be posted on IMAX site because the uh, Canadian citizens partners that should have the right to see what all First Nations are spending. First 
and overall they should not have Asian citizenship law. Pardon me? Appeals and redress. When we talk about laws, we you know we need some place to go and when our laws are challenged. So instead of having 40 or 39 uh, appeals and redresses in, uh, in First Nations, that is not a nation can develop uh, an appeals and redress where we can send our concerns, our uh, appeals for our laws to this one place. Now, if, if, if we come up with a law that's, uh, that the Michelle Nation has been told to make, and if the single seven says, no, I don't want that, uh, we're going to do our own. Of course, that's exactly what the city can do. The government will not tell the First Nations what to do. The Michelle Nation government will work for the Michelle Nation. Uh, sorry, for the First Nation. These governments also, the First Nation and the Michelle Nation, will have the same legal status and capacity of any other government. And why we need to say that is because under the Indian Act, we're wars. We don't have the legal authority to sign contracts. That's why a lot of First Nations have to be corporations and hold, hold money in trust. But under this agreement, we will be a legal entity and the Shabbat Nation government will be a legal entity and we won't have to incorporate and, and, and set our money to a corporation We'll be able to hold our own funding in our own government and manage it. And to be very, very clear, the Union of Ontario Indians will not be the Nishabat Nation government. The Nishabat Nation government will be made up of those First Nations that ratified this agreement. And where that government will sit is going to be determined by the First Nations that ratified the agreement. It could be in the four regions, it could be in here, it could be in the Dohees. That will be decided when this ratification vote is done. It's not in the agreement because it's not up to the negotiators or Canada to decide what that government looks like or where it's going to be or what it's going to do. That is the First Nations authority and decision. And absolutely not the Union of Ontario Indians decision. Um, under this agreement, there is a new fiscal framework. Uh, this framework will talk a little bit more in the next presentation. They keep losing cases and they have to keep paying. 
So they have the money, they just never, they didn't give it to us. And where that money is coming from? Yeah, it's probably coming from our lands and our, our own resources. But having a government, a own legal entity, is exactly what we want to fight to make sure we get our share of our own resources. So that's something to look forward. Now your second question is, how are we going to How are we going to make sure this money doesn't get, uh, doesn't get exploited or whatever? That's going to be your, your uh, um, can't go back, your financial management laws. That's where you're going to set up how you're spending, how money is spent. And then under your constitution, and chief, if any time you want to come in and make a comment, please come on. Yeah. Those, those can uh, actually damage here too, so when it comes down to accountability, whether, whether we're talking about the money that we're operating on today, or any future monies coming in, that falls underneath our current financial management law that we have. And uh, we've just went through a series of uh, protocols to establish ourselves as a, a, a financially certified First Nation, which is the highest standard. I think we're fourth in Canada to achieve that, that status. To And what that does is ensures the citizens and any um, businesses or government that we deal with that our financial laws are the highest standard of, of any First Nation in Canada. So those are there, those are there already. That means that things have changed from, say, about 20 years ago. Yeah. Everything is different. Well, absolutely. Uh, we're when did we get our Canadian Financial Management Act? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
financial part of it and the common sense part of it. You know, there is no threshold on how many First Nations to ratify this agreement. But if there's three or four, I don't know, maybe I, I, I don't think that that would be the Anishinaabeg Nation government because it would represent everyone. But that's up to those First Nations as well. This is a 
reading what uh, Hayden King had to say on, on this. We're not even further ahead. We're still under the Union Act, no matter how we look at it. Heck. Okay, we're, we're trying to, sure, we're trying to move ahead. And I agree, like I said before, we're at some point we've got to move ahead. But if the government is still the one to decide who is Union and who is not, where are we? Thank you for, for, for those observations. I, I can see your, your reading uh, material that's fine, and, and it's good that you're doing the homework because not everybody has that ability and to do that and to give their, their view and help uh, in the community. But you know, when it comes to citizenship, uh, the world is changing, and Indian status is actually losing its clout that it used to have. There was a court decision called the Manuals Decision. And it dealt with the Métis people. It dealt with what they call non-status Indians. So what I mean does is they get a pot of money, and they say, here, Métis Association, you figure out who your people are and how you're going to budget that money. They do the very same thing with non-status Indians. There's a group called the CCAP in Ottawa, and they deal with all non-status Indians. They give them a pot of money, and they say, you figure out what's going to spend on health, social, all this stuff. When Indians are not as different, what they do is they say, we control who are entitled to this money. Uh, but here you go, First Nations, uh, trying to deal with it, and they deal with it as well. So they're actually doing, um, they're treating us differently when the Constitution of Canada and the Charter says they should treat all people the same. So what they're doing is they're backing away from the status concept. And they're saying, here's your money to deal with governance, citizenship, elections, all that stuff. You figure out how to spend it. And that's okay, because we can do a better job. I feel we can do a better job. So the whole idea of concept of status is losing its uh, funding implications. We're becoming more invisible. Well, you, you can look at it that way, it, but um, it's different. Our agreements don't give up our nationhood. In fact, this is government to government relationship, and the Indian Act is a government title to Indian relationship. They determine who's a status Indian. They deal with all that. So, so you know, there's, there's different ways to look at it. Just to, to add to that, um, one, of, one of the things I've always been determined about when I got into politics, and, and that's dealing with. The um, legislating is out of existence and, and trying to prevent that. And the way I look at our citizenship laws, if we make our laws, if, if, if 
So the question is, the class system, are we going to get back to the class system in our, in our form of government? That is totally up to our membership to decide. And that's the, the beauty of, of this, is that the Indian Act is no longer going to dictate on how we govern ourselves. How we govern ourselves is going to be based on community values and community principles. And personally, when I think of the, the class system, there's a lot of really, really good things to get out of that class system. But can we restore it to the way it was 300 years ago? I don't think so, because the world has changed so much. But can we take the values and the principles out of those kind of teachings and apply them to today? Absolutely. And it's up to us to decide if that's what we want to do. And, and that's the beauty of this agreement is that we no longer will be handcuffed by the Indian Act on how to govern things. It will be up to us as a community. Yes, uh, grandparents aren't able to visit our children or great grandchildren. That's exactly right. We, are, we have done the blueprint and we are building the foundation for our, our children. And I know I don't mean little children. Because when this started, my oldest son would have been 27. The youngest son wasn't even born. So the future's now. We can't leave our children and grand, great, great, grandchildren, great grandchildren, or anybody. We can't leave them with the Indian Act because we're just going to continue to be stagnant where we are now. But, uh, Rick, you have a question?
later on. But basically, the weights are mail and ballots, and if you didn't get one, you can request one. Uh, the other way is in person. Here, it'll be a polling station uh, later on in February. Um, and the other way is through internet, internet voting. So if you want to be involved, uh, I applaud you for that and for wanting to vote and make a decision how the community make a decision about this. So there's ways to go. Okay, and so what, what, what she's saying is she, she lives off in another community. She doesn't live in, in, in this thing. So what's the point? The point is that you're right. You're right as an innocent citizen to be involved. One day you might want to come home and you'll want to know what these laws are that are going to affect you. And you might want to have a say in those laws. Or your children or your grandchildren might come back. But for right now, it's your right to vote. It's your right to be part of this process because you are a citizen.
We have 11 other First Nations after two or three years ready to take hold to join in. So it is building and it will be one unified where we can have a say from the grassroots, from each community up to build those laws that are not about everybody's but are only the community. So I just wanted to make a comment on that. And my last question is, we talked about the five-year physical agreement and we know we've seen First Nation um, because of their financial management system it hasn't even been looking at a 10-year because it's been protected so well in the community. Um, is there a possibility once everything coming out of the IMAC that we can collate that so everybody gets the five-year instead of in this agreement? Five years over here, ten years for this over here, uh, one year for this. I think that would be a challenge, and that's something that we'll have to look at because we want to make work plans for all areas of the community. That's five year commitment as opposed to one year here, five year here. This group gets ten years, and so that's something I think um, hopefully can be future negotiated.
seven times. And it amounts to close to 100 million. If all 40 First Nations were to get into this agreement, which is still a possibility now the road, we're looking at half a billion dollars. Half a billion in five years. So it's a significant amount of money which gives us more importantly than the things we do with the club, with government, and others to move on the bigger initiatives, bigger projects. Memphis City is doing so well. I have had an opportunity, I'm very fortunate, to go to, to most of the 40 First Nations that are part of the Nishanbek. And I can honestly say that Memphis City is one of the most advanced First Nations that there is. Um, so that's the fiscal offer, the keyword is seven times. Up to seven times? No, but, but it's pretty close to seven times in ballpark. <laughs> um, the current governance funding, uh, which is called Mass Floor Funding, and governance related and employee benefits, sits below 600000 a year for almost all Shabbat First Nations. Uh, Shabbat First Nations are in the $200,000 to $400,000 range. The fiscal offer ensures that no Nishabek First Nation will receive any less than 1.7 million. So it's a significant increase for all our bands. Um, First Nations will receive increased money starting on the effective date. So what's this effective date? Usually it's April 1st, and when they're talking about for the government's group, it's April 1st, 2021. That's the effective date, and the funding will start from that point forward. Uh, specifically regarding Nimbus First Nation, I don't know if actually um, that, that track. Um, so I don't know if we're allowed to webcast Nimbus Inc.'s funding. Um, <laughs> so maybe, I don't know if you want to pause the that time.
citizenship laws, uh, uh, management operations, government, election laws, those kind of things. And really it's the setup, the foundation, because studies have shown when you have that solid, solid foundation, there is more economic development, which will result in more money for bad members, for families, for businesses to operate and prosper. So in the long run, it, it does support each bad member in the sense of their revenue creation. Thanks, Ray. And just, just to add to that, I think it's important to know that First Nation communities, including ours, have been operating for the last, you know, 50, 60 years with underfunding. And we've been doing everything, uh, big borrowing, stealing, to make ends meet, uh, underpaying staff, uh, doing all these things, whatever we can to survive. And we've always been said, you know, saying that we do more as a government with less. And, and this agreement is finally bringing us up to a standard that is at least a basic equivalent to, to other governments, what they get to, to provide services for their communities. So, we can't be uh, honest for, for doing good work in the past, and, and this is really just bringing us up to a standard that is uh, practiced throughout uh, other, other communities uh, when it, when it uh, deals with delivering uh, services in, in governing communities. So it's not about uh, a cash settlement for uh, wrongdoing or land claims or anything like that. This is about supporting governance and recognizing that we are a government and that we need financial resources to govern properly. That's right, we got to
this, this thing called open source revenue. Under the internet, Aboriginal governments use some of their revenue towards the cost of providing programs and services. This is because, because funding from tax and that. This is some of the stuff she probably was just talking about. Um, now,
questions on this?
Thank you.